So when a band release a retrospective or greatest hits, it's usually the start of the end. It's oh, a yeah. fact. Bands yeah. bring them out, they fall so apart the, the finished, week after. Finished a long fucking time ago. We're just doing it for the money. <laughs> Make your We always get badgered about it in interviews about best ofs. And I've never been one for greatest hits, but a best of the best of's not the they're, fucking same they're, thing. They're not so bad. Well no, no matter which way fucking go around it, it's the fucking same thing. No, Champagne Supernova's not been a hit, has it? True. You know, a lot of bands' first singles, they they're kind of finding their feet a bit, you know. We were we we hit the ground running with that one. That song, at the time it came out, separated us from every other single band in the country who were all still immersed in irony. It's still a blinder to me. It still, it still sounds like it was written and recorded yesterday. I need to be recorded in one night in Liverpool. We, were, we went in to do a demo of Bring It On Down from the gig and uh, we couldn't get it right and we had to have something and I went in the back room and wrote Supertonic in about half hour, recorded it the rest of the night. That's, that's, that's the rough mix, it was never remixed either. It was a magical night, it was brilliant. So who picked the tracks? I did. And then presented them? No, yeah. just fucking done it and that was it. That's not true. He didn't present that. That's the first time I've fucking seen him. That's not true. Because you said you floated the idea, and I don't really see Oasis sitting in a meeting, you know, around a big floating idea, is it? That's no, how it no, we don't. There's never an Oasis meeting. We don't. It's just only, an Oli Gallagher meeting. We've only. That's not true either. I never realised how good it was until we went out and played it live. the gigs all around the world, people were going bananas for that song and that nearly ne that never nearly made it onto Don't Believe the Truth, never mind this. Look for you playing that live then, yeah, is that I love favorite? it man, I love it, I love fucking guitars, I love the drums, I love the vocals, I love it all mate, it's dead easy, it's not, it's not cryptic or anything, it's just an out and out fucking great rock and roll and if you don't like that kind of thing, then get the fuck out of it, you know what I mean, it's, that's the way I see it when I sing it. The last time he came to a meeting, he insisted we all, he would come in the room and he said, Die, 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 ginger. What are you all talking about? And we're like, we're talking about this. He said, well, let's talk about this apple. <laughs> he picked the apple out of a fruit bowl <laughs> and says to Emma, what, what's this apple for? What's it for? And she went, it's for fucking eating. And he went, oh, I'm getting off. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Uh, this one's called Talk Tonight. Yeah, that a lot, man. Well, we're on our first tour of, the, of, of America, and um, funnily enough, me and, me and the singer had a falling out. <laughs> and I'd got, the, I'd got the needle, and got my passport back off the tour manager, and said, right, that's it, I'm fucking out of here. And got in a taxi and went to San Francisco and then to Las Vegas, and uh, just had a bit of a bit of a lost week and uh, wrote that song and Half the World Away and It's Good To Be Free. But, I wanna talk tonight. but was it not a couple that persuaded you to rejoin Oasis when you're in Las Vegas? That's the story. And you wrote Talk Night based on that conversation, just a random yeah. couple said in Oasis. No, it was the, I, I managed to get hold of a, a copy of and it's a melody maker. And we'd already booked this tour in, in England and it had all sold out and the, there was an advert and all the gigs had sold out. And um, I kind of I kind of met up with this girl and she was going, you'd be fucking mad if it's all blowing up over there, you know. And I was like, yeah man, fuck it. So if you hadn't met that girl, would you inevitably be back with Oasis a week later, or is that an important meeting if you talk no, about it? No, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd have gone, of course I'd have gone back. What are they going to do without me? <laughs> Fucking bonehead takeover or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think <clears throat> Liam, what would you have done with her, I think, and they came back? <sighs> Fuck knows. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck knows, okay. he knows.
who cares because he's back. Is there a story to be told in the tracks that you picked a definitive well, timeline? Uh, to, to, to me, the, the songs that are on it are the songs that we generally have played live over the last 14 years or however long it's been. Those are the songs that I, I, I feel is our best work. See, do you hear that? Aye. I'd have left that out. I want to put that on there. Today was gonna be the day, but they'll never throw it back to you. It's not one of my favourites, but it is a great song. I don't believe that anybody. I've heard a version of it by Ryan Adams, which I think is brilliant. And Mike Flowers Pops cover it as well. Yeah. Right. Somebody, somebody on Radio One when they first played it said that they'd found the original Wonderwall. They played it on Radio One as, and the premise was, ah. The blagging bastard. <laughs> they found this tune from the 50s. <laughs> I got a fucking phone call. I was in the States off someone going, Did um, you know Wonderwall? And I'm going, Oh yeah, man, yeah. And they're going, You did write that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. I said maybe. Well, there's only there's this tune doing the rounds in England that they're claiming. <laughs> and I was like, Really? And somebody played it me down the phone. And I was like, You bunch of dicks. Five of us, four of us can't sit in a room and pick a track listing. I always, I always pick the set list, and if anybody's got a problem with it, they say, right, I'm not, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. It's the same with the track list, and I picked it. It all went round. I didn't get any of the usual phone calls at, you know, quarter to four in the morning. Yeah, what about little James, man? It's fucking classic. <laughs> you know, we'll, yeah, we'll we'll we'll, no, we'll definitely, no, uh, we'll definitely you know, save that for when we do do a fucking greatest thing. I didn't, I didn't get one of them, so I, I assumed, <laughs> I assumed that everybody was happy with it. To me, that's the archetypical Oasis song, I think. It's kind of, you know, like the archetypical Beatles song is we can work it out where they go, that, that's what defines Beatle music. I think some might say defines what Oasis is. That song freaks me out because it's on Morning Glory and it doesn't, to me, when I think about it, I, don't, I think of it as a, as a, as a one-off single on its own with, with Acquiesce because it wasn't recorded at, at the Morning Glory sessions, it was done way before that. I wrote it, it up the road here in Chiswick, in a bed sit, when I was poor, I was, I was living in Chiswick. At those points I used to write really pissed and out of it, so I can't, I can't remember what, what I was thinking about. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know what it's about to be honest, but it's in there because it's our first number one as well, and it, and it's nobody, nobody wrote songs like that at that time, with that kind of rock and roll riff, you know. That, and we had that in fucking every tune was like that. It was brilliant. So what are you calling it? Calling it "Stop the Clocks." And do you want to know why? Well, I know, but tell, tell everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> well, because, well, because it, uh, well, I mean, we, we, might, we might put some bookmark in, like that's what we've done. Yeah, right there. All right, yeah, so, it was one of those. Well, if I can understand it, then fucking well, so can uh, the rest of the cunts. Precisely. So don't fucking buy it and stop asking questions, you bunch of cunts. <laughs> I like the structure on that tune, man, more than anything. Everything about it is fucking amazing. Well, I'm super proud of that. It's already one of our classics, you know. It's just so different. And it's the song about being a lazy fucker and just, but being proud of your own laziness and being amazed by your own laziness. And I like the sound of it. And I like the fact that it was recorded in our studio and, you know, with no, no outside help from anybody. And the drums are brilliant on it. And it's a great British pop song.
So the retrospective is, it, it seems to me very much picked from a, a purely musical point of view. This doesn't document the high points and low points, this documents where we think are the best tunes. I didn't put it together because, oh, that bit's great playing, all oh, that stuff, that's an amazing recording, because some of them are kind of quite listening back to them, and not some of the great recordings, do you know what I mean? Some of, some of the latest stuff is, uh, is brilliantly recorded. Well, it's but sound like a nice flowing record, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I think that's his best ever singing on that. Yeah. I don't know. Well, Slide Away is everybody's favourite and we don't play it enough live. Funny enough, but it's Paul McCartney's favourite track, isn't it? Of all time. Yeah, He's always had taste that for <laughs> It's a fucking, it's a rocking, it's, it's, a, rocking, it's, it's a rocking love song, man. It's fucking. Yeah. It was, it was quite quickly knocked off in the studio as well, and it was done that in Wales, right? Yeah, that was that's the one song that that, that survived from the first ever definitely maybe sessions, the ones that were scrapped. That and Rock and Roll Star, I think, survived. But that that should have been a single. Um, it was it got to the point where after cigarettes and alcohol came out that they wanted to release it, and it's like you can't have five off a debut album because if you do, someone's gonna have to get me a fucking Learjet, you know, because I'm not. <laughs> Because if Michael Jackson's doing five singles albums and I have, he's got a monkey and a jet. <laughs> I don't want a monkey, but I fucking want the aeroplane. I can't see anybody having a problem with the track list, and apart from there's the connoisseurs who go, where's it's good to be free? And it's like, well, yeah, but God, going back to that though, if that's the fucking case, it's like, you know, you do these songs, they go out, there's not, you know, we're not, you know, we're not being cunts by leaving a fucking certain tune off, that's just the way, well, Noel is, but, you know, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's just, the, exactly. that's just the fucking way it is, you know that's what I mean? It. I'm like, you know, you've got to leave some off. That song just keeps getting better and better for me. in the States when it come out as the fourth single off Definitely Maybe and we kind of got a little lent on to put a fourth single out and I wasn't into the idea at all so I was like fourth single fucking hell I don't know about that and anyway out it comes and we're in Detroit I remember it to this day because I ended up in hospital that night and we we're in Detroit and got the phone call that not only had it got in the charts that it was the biggest selling single we'd ever had the fourth single off Definitely Maybe and I remember putting the phone down going now we're fucking talking here. This is going to get fucking stupid. <coughs> Where's the monkey? Yep. Fucking <laughs> 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 chimp. Yeah. And uh, there was, it was kind of like, right, well, there's no going back from this now. This is going to be sensational. I remember writing it in, in Manchester and two guys used to live above me. And I, on those days, the fucking geezer that I was, I used to write on the electric guitar with my amp in the fucking room in a block of flats on 10. And uh, one of the guys might have worked at the Hacienda as a local crew guy or something. And I remember him once passing me in the stairs going, you're not going to fucking write a song with that riff, are you? That's fucking rubbish. And I was going, listen, fat ass, it's going to be fucking amazing when it comes out. <laughs> and, I, and I remember going down to the rehearsal room and writing this song. And Boneheads used to always be the fucking tut tutter, didn't he? Sick guy, you know. Yeah. I remember coming out, I've got this tune called Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> so I go down, I've got this tune called Cigarettes and Alcohol, and he does his. Cigarettes and Alcohol. It's a bit, yeah, you're going to change the title. And then I've done the riff, and he's just going, whoa, whoa, you can't fuck it, that's T Rex. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't give a shit who it is, no one's ever going to hear it anyway, give a fuck.
getting old we've got like bars or in a hanger. What? Bars? He's invested in any hanger. He hasn't he said. Yeah, but what, I would buy a bar. No, not buy a bar, it's not like so. I'm a florist, any hanger. Could you imagine the phone call going, Liam, look, I know I, I know we're brothers and all that, but it's 500 grand now. <laughs> you know, so you pay the fucking tab. <laughs> <laughs> What's up here, boy? Go on. Yeah. No, it's Liam. Am I still bad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's one of our best tunes. Doesn't matter who, who wrote it. Talking to the sound bed yesterday. Threw me to a pair that far away. I love it, man. It's fucking <coughs> too cold. I fucking speak about it. Like, no, you don't say nothing fucking interesting. <laughs> great to get on it or fuck off and be a dick. So she can give her all the love she gives to me. Talk about I wrote that as a one-off. I was in France. We were out in this massive fucking mansion doing our album. But I went out with a guitar one day, sat under a tree, had a bit of a biblical moment, and that popped up, and that was it. Didn't do it to present. No, I just fucking wrote it. Three minutes, I was like, well, it took, and I think I wrote all the words like pretty much there and then. A man can never dream these kind of things, especially when she came and spread her wings. And that was that then for the bit, I got writer's block. <laughs> I've, only just, I've only just picked the ball up. Yeah. He, he wrote Little James and Songbird in the same year and was just like, oh, fuck, God, I've fucking got to go for a lie down here. It's all then. Six minutes of music. I even have to push to put it into the set because he just won't have it. Do you think it drags on a bit? It's two minutes and one second long. Do you think it drags on a bit? It's like, what fucking crazy drugs are you on? This one's called the Master Plan. It's about being young. And you're all young, you're all making history today, never forget that. The Master Plan is the Master Plan. We're all part of a master plan. Take the time to make some sense of what you want to say. Cast your words away upon the way. Master plan, uh, the biggest regret I think I ever have out of any of the tunes have just been a Ed Strong fuckwit saying, no, it's a B side. It was written as a B side and the B side it shall stay. I think. It's Cause fucking hell, some things haven't changed then, isn't it? Yeah. You ain't got a clue what you're releasing, man. I know. I'm an idiot. It's one of my favourite of my songs, because there are certain songs for me that are great, but then there's, a, there's the chosen few that you really fucking nail it. Like the words, the melody, the structure, everything is all, all the playing's brilliant. And that's one of them. Even the backwards guitar solo was so blagged, it was unbelievable. It was like me and Owen turned the tape over, I got fucking clue what I was doing. And then we switched it back. And it was like, actually, that's fucking pretty incredible. It's just such luck. Somebody said go and write a B-side, so that I remember having <laughs> with Alan McGee and going, look, you asked me to write B-sides and that's what I've come up with. And he went, but it's too good, you know, and I was going like, well, I don't write shit songs, you know. Fast forward about three years and I'm like, fucking, <laughs> can we put Master Plan out as a single? <laughs> It's the first time we ever got close to sounding like a modern day Beatles, I think. Which is what we were striving for for years and years and years. Ain't no illusion. Try to click with what you got. Taste every potion. Cause if you like yourself a lot, go let it out. Go let it in. I was pretty uninspired at the time about writing the letting music but go let it out, it stands head and shoulders above anything else. It's a New York fucking hipster tune man. It's up there with some of the best things I've ever done. I think 
have a loop on it from... Um, oh, from not Austin Powers. No, it wasn't Austin Powers. No, it was. No, it's no, Austin no, it was from not Austin Powers. It was from Thingy. Fucking old Magic Roundabout. Not Magic Roundabout, dude. That was Windy it. Miller. Remember Windy Miller? Remember Windy Miller? You don't know, uh, remember the Magic Trumpton. Roundabout. Trumpton. No, 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 the Magic Roundabout. No, remember the Windy Magic Miller. Roundabout. Trumpton. There was, a, there was the bit in the middle where, it, before it goes into the goal edit output, there was lots of sound effects. Bollocks, it's like fucking... This is man. shattering everyone's fucking illusions. But they, all, they, all, they have you as great songwriters and it's, it's, it's Trumpton and Austin Powers. No, it wasn't. Uh, Austin Powers. Powers, I don't know about the Austin Powers. No, I Trumpton. remember the beginning bit, started with the drum loop. Yeah. And it, Austin Powers saying... Uh, Something like kids have been taking mind bending yeah, drugs yeah, since the yeah. sixties. I mean, it was only yeah. for personal yeah. fucking. Oh, we've got. never going to make it on the record. So there's there's basically a Trumpton bootleg. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. All our demos oh, are fucking top. They're, they're, actually, they're not flying about. They're in my fucking house. Yeah. They're actually quite fucking. They're quite wild. Hidden in between a fucking apple, a sliced apple. <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to scoot twenty minutes. All right. I'll be on it. We'll we'll let him get off and then we'll. We'll crack on, eh? We'll, we'll do the again. proper record. Yeah, we'll do we'll the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We just go to a wide angle, just for like we'll, the we'll, two or three things. We'll Talk. tell him the real title then. Yeah. It was the tune, as I remember, that changed everything. Maybe I don't really want to know how you got in ground. Just fly. It seemed to be one day we were a certain kind of band. I mean, it was written before the record deal or anything like that, and then that set off a chain reaction that everything followed. There was the what? I was the, the tune that that's, that got us a record deal. Really, once McGee heard it, he was like, "Fuck, you know, didn't get any more money out of the cunt, huh?" At the time it was written in the middle of grunge and all that, and I remember Nirvana had a tune called I Ate Myself and I Want to Die. Yeah. Which I was like, well I'm not fucking having that. As much no as way. I fucking like him and all that shit, I'm not, I'm not having that. I'm not, I can't have people like that coming over here on smack fucking yeah, saying that they ate themselves that. and they want to die. That's yeah. fucking rubbish. And I'm not saying it was written directly as a... As that, but that was my thinking was, fuck that man, kids don't need to hear that nonsense. It seemed like to me he was a guy that had everything and was miserable about it. And we had fuck all, and I still thought that getting up in the morning was the greatest fucking thing ever because you didn't know where you'd end up at night, mm. you know. And we didn't have a pot to piss in, but it was fucking great, man. Yeah. Oh, it was nice going on stage playing that tune when you got all these other fucking indie bands like diddly diddly did, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's who we were playing with at the time. You know them people. I know the fucking people. So it was like when we dropped that man, you know, and I'm talking like fucking I. When we dropped it and stuff, <laughs> it was fucking. We knew we would have bollocked. When that was released, you know, looking back over the sort of Oasis history, that was a turbulent time, wasn't it? That was arrests and all sorts and yeah, folk. it was fucking. Being back them fucking days, man. It was kind it's of got a easy now, man. Taking the kids to school, I'm gonna fucking leather fucking someone tomorrow. At the fucking. <laughs> About 9 15 tomorrow, just to get back in the papers and back their handcuffs on me. You know what I mean? I got the feeling of having their handcuffs, man. Put out the gayness in me. Every time we play it, it's brilliant. When he sings the first line every night, it's kind of, you know, you're at a fucking gig there. That's why I always play it early on. It's like, just fucking gonna kick off here now. Nobody, but nobody at the record company had any say in what we've done. Now, it's kind of like, all right, you see the ball guy, he's got to go, mm -hmm. right? And uh, there's not been all this shit about drugs because now you're working for the fucking man and you're a commodity. We forget this shit. We just documenting where we were at. We were doing shit loads of fucking drugs at the time. And that was shocking, you know, like, the, the drugs is like having a cup of tea quote. That, they, there were TV crews outside my house for three days after that. What's the story, rolling, Michael Howard, then Home Secretary, was like, 
He should be kicked out of Oasis the same as Brian Harvey was kicked out of E17. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? You know, the bonehead going in, yeah, we've had a meeting and uh, you're just, you're a fucking liability. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got to fucking you go. Gotta go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Brian yeah. Harvey. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm it. sorry, <laughs> but you've got to fucking go. <laughs> and, um, but now, Inject crack up your fucking arsehole and washing up liquid in into it. You, know, you know what I mean? Back in the back in the day, no, no, we were no, no, we were kids. like we were like public enemy number one and two. You bought a boat? A boat? Right? No. It's metal. I've got a boat. I've got a boat. I never bought it though. It came with an house that I purchased. Seriously? Yeah. This is one for a friend of mine at the back. It's quite a melancholy song about leaving. So all all, all, all those songs it? around that time, around the definitely maybe time, are all about leaving somewhere and going arriving somewhere else, and it's all going to be fucking great. In the end. They said they'd done this sitcom thing and they wanted to use an Oasis song. I'd have thought they'd have married with children, I would have thought would have been a better bet. But um, they asked permission and we've seen it, the Royal Family, before. Well, I still think it's one of the best things. Jim Royal is That's an fun. absolute hero of mine. Mm. And, um, the silence is mine, I love that. Yeah. Mm. They can't give me the dreams of the mind anyway. It's a real early one. It kind of documents that period of like, right, I'm leaving this place and I'm going to London. There's too many people to piss off to stay up here. You're right, laugh. I guess we always knew we were never going to stay in Manchester. Even him get on the fast track to death, thinking about buying a bar, of saying, you got too much money. That's what a big you. Do you buy properties? Cameras. Property. No. Do you all that stuff? No, I stick it in the bank. Of course he does. He's got, four, he's got shit. I've got half an house. He's got about fucking nine. Lives in the smallest one. So that about. That's not true. It's just a great song. Should have been a single. I got slagged off at the time as well, you know. That's one song that we've, ever since it was released, I think we've played it every night, where possible. Um, so it's, it's a tune, man. It is a tune. Just before we went into Record Morning Glory, it was a real great period for us. We were sat on a tour bus in Germany. We got to this hotel early, so none of the rooms were ready. So oh, we sat, how he remembers all this so stuff? We sat, so we sat in the car park, right? Are you fucking 100% sure of it? I am 100% I'm sure. I put one of my houses on it. So somebody says, we're going in to do Morning Glory the next week. Have you got any tunes for the new album? And I said, well, we went up to the back line, so I'll play them for you for one. And uh, I played the law and fucking cast my shadow and, and all this. And <laughs> Played Champagne Supernova in its entirety on acoustic guitar and looked up and at the end, Bonin was crying. You've not just written that, have you? Fuck, <laughs> toy. <laughs> toy. <laughs> I love you. Uh, Bonin was crying. <laughs> and I was looking, I'm thinking, you're fucking soft like that. Either that or it's shit. Oasis music. I thought you said. Yeah, but if you if we rewind the tape back, you'll see that I cut a lot with that. If you rewind the tape oh, back, cut that bit out. Yeah. yeah. Wrote that on a train on the way to local studios for 
the sessions have definitely made me doing some of fucking for that. And it got stuck in the seven I had an acoustic guitar. I remember that. And I, you weren't there. I was on my own. I don't remember that. Because fucking hell, I wasn't just fucking going, oh, it's fucking, can't wait to get a fur coat. Furry dog. I'm going to be the bollocks. I was taking it all in, man. I was like, yeah, pass me the guitar. Yeah. What's that word, Acquiesce? What does that mean? I, what I'm amazed by is the fact that, you know the second verse, I only hope to say the things I wish I said, so I'll sing my soul to sing and say, never sings it live, ever. What, then? Do you always forget it? Yeah. I've never heard it before. What words are them? Well, you wrote another verse. There's another verse in it that you just refuse to sing. Don't refuse, man. I've never heard what it. What is it about it? You don't like it? You it's don't not that I don't it. like it. I've never heard it. Where them? <laughs> the geezer who puts the words in front of me has obviously fucked it off. Yeah. He just, I just, say, I, just say, I just sing what I read, man. <laughs> You know what I mean? The geezer. the geezer who pops the words in front of me. <laughs> Jason, man, you know what I mean? word midget. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's obviously it's not there, man. Oh, the squats behind the fucking I just, think, I just see what's in front of me. That was a good moment when we recorded that in the, in the, in the studio. I remember th thinking, fucking hell, this is going to be brilliant. Slip inside the eye of your mouth. That was written in an hotel room in Paris right? when we were on the way 